In 2011, the National Act Coalition announced an intention to introduce charter schools into the New Zealand educational landscape. Associate Professor Peter O'Connor became one of the most vociferous critics of the policy and recorded a widely viewed primer on charter schooling and its possible impact in New Zealand. In this interview, he revisits the issue three years on. When we pr produced our first video on charter schools, it was as they were being uh, introduced. We now call them partnership schools, or some people call them partnership schools in, in New Zealand. What we know is that our fears then have been realised, that the worst possible kind of model has been introduced in New Zealand, that although we were promised that international research would be done to look at the very best, that clearly didn't happen. If you have a look at the, the official papers um, by the Implementation Committee, no research was done that we can see at all on, on charter schools. It's simply a model that was dumped in which has all the worst features. We have unregistered, unqualified teachers, lack of transparency, an incredible amount of taxpayer money going in to support them at a level far exceeding other state schools. We know already that some of those schools are running into trouble. We've had a, a return of the national-led government supported by, by ACT, where the ACT party in its policy statement says it wants to make every school in New Zealand a charter school. So, should we still be concerned? Yes, we should be. Has there been a trial? No, there hasn't been a trial. Do we know what the impact is and has been across the system? No, we don't. Have we got anything in place to track that? No, we haven't. What we do have is international evidence which suggests that charter schools create a wedge to increase and to hasten privatisation in education, that they are a direct attack on, on the teacher unions and that sits at the very heart of this experiment. This has nothing to do with lifting achievement of children in poorer areas of New Zealand. Peter O'Connor maintains that the slow rollout of charter schools has been a deliberate attempt to downplay their critical role in the government's agenda. Well, the Prime Minister, when he announced the introduction of charter schools after the 2011 election, said there was going to be two and that we shouldn't be worried about two. And well, there's five and then there's eight. And we know from the Charter School Reference Group that there was talk of up to 30. We also know that the briefing that the Charter School Implementation Group had from uh, Leslie Longstone was that they should move slowly and that her experience in the UK with the introduction of free and academy schools was that they were able to take what she talked about as a considerable share of the market for charter schools and increasing, of course, um, private schools as well. So yes, one can say this is a very small experiment, but, what we're, but I think the important thing is to consider the, the ideology and the philosophy behind charter schools and what it promises for wider radicalisation of the state education system. Associate Professor O'Connor rejects the claims that charter schools are designed to offer an alternative to regular schooling. Catherine Isaac presents charter schools as a form of alternative education. David Seymour talks about it in terms of choice and Hekia Parata talks about it being an experiment that's worth trialling. So it's quite difficult at times to get a handle on exactly what this is about until one begins to really unpick what the what I would consider the true agenda to be, which is, which is one of privatisation. The, the issue I think around alternatives is that the moment that one of the charter schools got into trouble, Hekia Parata says, well, of course, they're working with difficult children. One can't expect miracles. And yet Hekia Parata, of course, expects miracles from state schools who haven't had the luxury of the kind of funding that charter schools have. And, and, and yet um, she's quite prepared to use the excuse of these are difficult children when charter schools run into problems. The current funding formula for charter schools of course provide an unfair advantage for them. The kinds of levels of funding which have been put into charter schools would be eagerly 
greeted by state schools across the country. So let's look at the, the middle school in, in South Auckland, which trumpets its one advantage over state schools is smaller class sizes, which according to the national government doesn't make a difference anyway to, 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 to learning outcomes. But surprise, surprise, in charter schools, um, they're quite happy to, to, to trumpet their aero success based on the one point of difference they have in the middle school of smaller, smaller class sizes. So the key question is, why are charter schools being funded at a level to give them greater advantage over other state funded schools? And one would suggest it's purely ideology. The charter school system in New Zealand has the worst features of charter schools internationally. They're conducted almost in secrecy with no access to information through the Official Information Act, through the Ombudsman. That's very difficult to ascertain whether or not they're really making the difference that they're claiming to make. They, they arrive without any consultation with, with local communities. We're now told under the, the next rollout that charter schools will be introduced into high growth areas. And that will happen, it would, would appear, without any negotiation with communities. And the concerns that I would have around the, that kind of implementation is the impact that those charter schools will have on other state schools in the area. And it would seem that there's very little consideration about the wider impacts of charter schools across the system. In the first three years of the national government, funding of private schools increased markedly, as these figures show. The introduction of charter schools has not slowed down the subsidisation of the private sector, and Associate Professor O'Connor believes charters and privatisation are parts of the same policy. Charter schools and the introduction of charter schools sits alongside a steady, increasing support for the private sector in education by this government. We see that in the support, for example, in Wanganui Collegiate. The enormous increases in government funding for private education, and it's all part of the same agenda, and that agenda is around dismantling state education. Uh, one wonders if it will become social education in the same way that state houses have become social houses. Um, but e essentially, it's the same agenda, and the agenda is the state moving increasingly out of the provision of core services like education and health and handing it over to the market. At the same time, charter schools undermine teacher unions and by employing unqualified teachers, devalue the profession. The, the current five charter schools could all have existed under the previous legislation. However, what would have been guaranteed is that all the teachers in those schools would have been registered and qualified we know that they would have been there and their work would have been um, part of the collective bargaining arrangements which, are, uh, which have taken place through, through the teacher unions. So part of this dismantling of, of state education through the, the wedge of charter schools is a direct attack on the professionalism of teachers. And it's around, through, through, through market forces, driving down teacher wages, driving down teacher conditions and driving down the power of the unions. John Banks in the introduction of the charter school legislation in, in 2013 made it really clear that for him this was all about the way in which the government could attack teacher unions. Internationally, the charter school movement has received many setbacks in the past year. And Associate Professor O'Connor says we in New Zealand can learn from this. A lot, a lot is happening internationally around charter schools. Increasingly, we're finding that charter schools are running into legal challenges around mismanagement, around the way in which they aren't enrolling children from minority or special needs groups. We're, we're finding that more and more they're, that they're hitting the wall, that that actually unregistered, unqualified teachers and the market isn't necessarily the answer to, to problems which are at heart centred around issues to do with poverty and inequality. That the, 
somewhat naive and simplistic view that, that if you hand education over to the market, it can solve the problems largely created by the market, is not true. We do know that charter schools can make a difference for some students, but that seems to me to miss the entire point. Because what we should be looking at is what, does the, what do charter schools do across the whole system? And what's really clear from the evidence is that they do not make a difference across the system. In the United States, where charter schools have been in operation for nearly 20 years, what we know is that if you come from a poor minority background, it is harder now to achieve educationally than it was 20 years ago. Now, charter schools might make a difference for one or two kids, and that's great. But what does it do across the whole system? It causes more problems then it creates success and across the system it has a negative impact and that's the international evidence. Even the Treasury said with the introduction of charter schools, look these aren't going to make the difference that advocates of charter schools say they will make.